Why should you use a cache? Well, the quick answer is improving your app's performance. When a client makes a request to your server, in this case, our NestJS application, in most cases, we're going to fetch some data from our database and then return it as a response back to our client. What happens when the number of clients increases? That would mean a bigger load on our database and slower API response times. One way of fixing this would be using a cache. From one side, accessing or retrieving data from a cache is faster than retrieving data from a database, and that's because accessing data which exists in memory is faster than accessing data that exists on disk. So that would mean faster API response times back to our client, that's a happy client. And on the other side, we're also reducing the number of calls made to our database since now we're accessing it less frequently and we're using a cache. So we end up with less load on our database and faster API response time, leading us to saying that using a cache improves our application's performance. Now let's see how we can implement caching in NestJS. The first thing we need to do is install NestJS slash cache manager and cache manager packages. Cache manager is a Node.js cache module that allows us to interact with our cache. So we can use a simple API to get data, set data, delete data from a cache. And it also supports different cache stores such as Redis, for example. To enable caching in our application, we should import the cache module and then call the register method on it. And the cache module comes from nest.js slash cache manager that we just installed. And then if we take a look here, we can see that we have many different properties that we can configure. For example, TTL or time to live is the amount of time that an item is stored in a cache before getting deleted. By default, it's five seconds. Then we have store. By default, it uses in memory store. But later on in this video, we're going to see how we can use Redis instead. We have max, which is the max items that can be stored in a cache at once. And then we have is global, which I'm going to set to true. Setting is global to true is going to allow us to use the caching functionalities everywhere in our application without having to import the cache module every single time. After registering the cache module, we can now use the cache manager provider to interact with our cache in our application. To inject the cache manager provider as a dependency, all we have to do is use the at inject decorator from nest.js slash common, and then the token name is cache manager, and then we call the variable cache manager, which is of type cache, which comes from the cache manager package. Now let's take a look at the different operations that we can do. So we have delete, get, set, and so on. Let's try to set an item in our cache. We need to provide a key name. So key one, let's say, and then a value, let's say hello. And let's try to return this item. So using get, and then we need to specify the key name, which is key one. I'm calling that get students method from our students controller. So slash students. And then I have imported the students module in our app module so we can call this API. If you go to Postman and hit send, as you can see, we retrieved the value hello correctly. Now to make things more interesting and realistic, I have implemented this retrieve students from DB method, which simulates a get operation from a database. So what I'm doing is I'm setting a timeout and then after one second, I am returning a list of students. So our job here inside of our async get student method is to check whether or not this data is stored inside of our cache. If that's the case, we return it right away from the cache itself without having to call our database. If not, we would need to get the response from our database and then store it in our cache for future use. So let's see how we can do that. First thing we need to do is check if we have the data cached. So in our cache manager, we use the get operation and we use the student's key to check if we have any cached student's data. If that's the case, then we return it right away. And here I set a log got data from cache. And then in case we don't have the data cached, then we would need to call this method as such. And now we would need to store it in our cache before returning it. That way, next time we make this API call, we're going to get the data from the cache and not from the database. So just like we've seen before, I used the set operation on our cache manager to set an item in our cache. I used the student's key and then added the student's data as a value and then I returned it. Now before making an API call and testing this out, I'm going to override the default TTL, which is five seconds. I'm going to set it to 30 seconds. 
Here it takes a number in milliseconds, so 30 times 1000. Now this is 30 seconds, meaning our items will be stored for 30 seconds in our cache and then they will be deleted. So let's go to Postman. If you hit send, as you can see, the response time was over one second. We got the data here. If we take a look at our logs, it did not say uh, got data from our cache. So it did retrieve it from the database. However, now if I hit send again, as you can see, it only took five milliseconds. And if you take a look in our log, we can see got data from cache. So the first time we didn't have anything in our cache, we had to retrieve the students from our database. After doing so, we have stored and saved the students' data inside of our cache for future use. And as you can see, fetching data from a cache is very quick. It only took five milliseconds to get that data. Now let's say you wanted to use a TTL of 30 seconds in your application, but in certain cases you wanted to override that value, you can do that. So whenever you are setting a new item in your cache, you have a third optional parameter, which is TTL. So here, for example, we could specify that for this item, we want to set the TTL to 60 seconds. So this item would be deleted after 60 seconds instead of 30 seconds. Thankfully, we don't have to write this logic every single time because Nest.js provides an automatic way of actually caching results and then retrieving them. But before we get into that, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Nest provides us with a cache interceptor that does that job for us. So here, if we say use interceptors, just like with any interceptor, it's called cache interceptor and it's from the Nest.js slash cache manager package. Just like any interceptor, it could be on the controller level or it could be on a route handler level, or it could even be globally for our whole application. In this case, we just want it to be on the controller level. Also, it's important to know that this cache interceptor only works with get route handlers. So anytime we have the get method, it does work on post, put, and so on. Now, since this cache interceptor does that logic for us, it checks if we have some cached data with the specified key, and then if that's not the case, it goes inside of our service and does the logic and get the data from our database and then it saves the response for future use. We no longer need to have this logic manually. We could just call retrieve students from DB and then here let's add a log inside service and I'm also gonna add this log here inside control. Now let's see what happens when we call this API. If I hit send as you can see, it took around one second. And then if you take a look at our logs, we can see inside controller and inside service, meaning that the cache interceptor didn't find anything in our cache. So it continued to our controller route handler and then the service here. Now, if we hit send again, as you can see this time, it only took four milliseconds. Let's hit send again, again, again. As you can see, it's very quick now, two milliseconds. If you go back here to our logs, we are not entering our controller and service anymore. So the cache interceptor is fetching the student's response from our cache and then returning it. Now, for example, that 30 seconds have passed, which is the TTL that we set. If we hit send again, as you can see, once again, it's one second, but if we hit send again, it's two milliseconds now. So the cache interceptor is working perfectly. Just like we've seen before, we can override this TTL over here, this time by using a decorator, so at cache TTL. And then here we could specify, for example, 60 times 1000, meaning 60 seconds. So the items here or the response from get students that is going to get cached by the cache interceptor will be deleted after 60 seconds. It's important to know that if you decide to use at res here to handle the response manually, this would not work properly with the cache interceptor. So that's just a side note. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, let's see how we can use Redis as our cache store. The first step is to install cache manager Redis yet. Now we need to import Redis store from cache manager Redis yet, and we can use the store property that we've seen previously and then pass in the Redis store as a value. If we take a look at Redis store, it's a function that takes some options, Redis clients, and then it returns a promise of a Redis store. Now, by default, if we just pass the Redis store to the store property, it's going to connect to a local Redis server. So localhost and then the default port that Redis uses. 
In my case, I have a Redis image from the official Redis, and then I am running this as a container. So I have a local Redis server here. If I open the CLI, Redis-CLI, if I hit ping, as you can see, it replied with Pong. So I'm connected to a local Redis server. You can do the same. You can get Docker desktop and then run a Redis container. Or if you're on uh, Mac or Linux, you can actually get the Redis server. So we just follow a simple tutorial online and get ready. Now to visualize the data inside of our Redis cache, I installed a software called Redis Insight. You can think of it just like MongoDB Compass is just a data visualizer for MongoDB. This is the same for Redis. So here we can see what keys we have and so on. Thankfully, and if you remember, I previously said that with Cache Manager, we can switch stores without actually having to change anything. So it provided us with a simple API that works with any uh, store. So now we don't really need to change anything in our code. And to verify that, if we hit send, it took one second. If you take a look here, inside controller, inside service. If we open Redis Insight and refresh, as you can see, we got an item here. And as we can see here, we have a time to live, which is 52 seconds now. If I refresh, 46, 45. And then we have a key name here, which is slash students. Now, previously, whenever we used the cache manager, whenever we injected it in our service here, we used cache manager dot set, and then we set the key manually. However, now the cache interceptor is the one caching our data. So as you can see by default, it used the route path as a key name. Also, if you take a look at the value here, we can see that it saved our data as a string in this case. So the type here is string, the key is students, and then the value is the students data that we are getting from our get database function. Now, if we refresh, the item is no longer here. It got deleted. And that's because the 60 second time to live was up. So it got deleted from our cache. So as you can see, everything we said, everything we worked on is working perfectly. Now let's say for any reason, and this is rarely the case, but let's say for any reason you didn't want to set a time to live, you wanted it to stay forever in the cache, you would use zero. If I hit save and restart now, it will take effect with the cache interceptor. Now if you take a look at Redis Insight, we don't have anything here, it's empty. If I hit send here, it took one second because we don't have anything cached yet. If we refresh our cache here, as you can see, we got the item key slash students. And then here we have our data. But this time, if we focus on time to live, it's no limit. And that's because we set the time to live value to zero, meaning infinity. Now, let's say you didn't want the cache interceptor to set the key for you. So we don't want it to use the route as a key here. You can override that just like we did with cache TTL. We can say cache and then here key. Let's call it, for example, my key, hit send, it got cached. If we refresh here, we can see we got a second item called my key. The first item did get deleted because the time to live is zero and we did not delete it manually. And the second item is the one that got cached right now, which is with the key, my key, and then has the value. Of course, now if we hit send again, it's going to fetch the response quickly. And that's because it's coming from our Redis cache this time, my key. Of course, if for any reason you didn't or couldn't use the cache interceptor in your use case, and you had to have manual control over your cache, you can still, like we previously seen, inject the cache manager as a dependency using the token name cache manager. And then here, just like we've seen, we have delete to delete an item, you specify the key, we have reset to empty the whole cache, delete all the items, and you can use get and set. So you can still use this for any use case you need. Now, of course, this is fine if you're playing around or testing a few things locally. However, for production, of course, you would need to configure that Redis store to connect to a Redis server on production. So you would need to pass in a username, a password, the host, and so on. So to do that, we would need to use the config service. And of course, to safely have your credentials, you would need to store them in a .env file. Now, if you're not very familiar with those terms, please, you should go back and watch my episode on configuration in Nest.js. But let's do that right now.
In case you haven't seen this or you haven't worked with config modules before, basically you install the nest.js slash config, which will allow you to register a config module using the for root method. And then here we can pass in some configuration. I passed or I loaded a config file. This config file returns or holds the redis information here. So for example, host and port. Of course, these are not going to be hard coded. So let's go ahead and create a env file. And then here we're going to set those. And of course, this env file should be added to git ignore. So you shouldn't commit this at all. These should be secure. And now here, we use process.env and then the key name that exists in our environment variable to read those values and store them in our config file here. And then in app module, we are loading this config file and then I'm setting it to global so that we can use this config service anywhere. Of course, the config service is provided because we have injected the config module here in our app module. Now we need to use that config service to read and get the values from the Redis host and port dynamically and use them in our store here instead of the default ones. To do that, we can replace register by register async. And if you're not very familiar with register async and use factory and inject, uh, please go back and watch a few of my episodes such as the MongoDB or the config service. I'm pretty sure we've mentioned this many times now, but basically here, uh, we are injecting the config service to be used as a dependency in our use factory method. So here we could say const store and then initialize that using Redis store that we imported previously from cache manager Redis yet. But this time we are going to set the values. So here, for example, we could say socket host, which was optional because by default it's local host. But now we're going to read it from this. So config.get and then Redis dot host and of course it's redis.host because here that's how it's nested and now here we need to return the store and any other options that could be returned from register so we could simply just say return store now i just realized i didn't add the imports array here and import the config module to use the config service but that wouldn't cause any issues because we have set the config module here as global now here we can also return different properties other than the store, such as TTL, max, and is global. Those are the same properties that we've seen with register previously. However, I found an issue. Uh, this is something I didn't know about until I was filming this video. So previously, you remember that we said that the TTL property is optional, and by default, it's set to five seconds. So in our cache, whenever we save a new item, it will take five seconds until it's deleted. Whenever we're using register async, this doesn't take effect anymore. I'm not sure why. I haven't really looked into it. But if you need to set a TTL whenever you're using the register async, set it here inside of the Redis store properties. That's pretty much it, guys. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like, subscribe, and I will see you next time.